course, as part of my worship experience. So that's going to start this coming Tuesday. Next off, we have a special fundraiser, which will be taking place this coming Wednesday. So uh, if you'd like to help out the, the Welcome In, which is a homeless ministry uh, that serves the homeless in South Oakland County. It's based out of a Covenant Presbyterian Church in Southfield. And it's uh, basically operated through uh, grants and through donations and fundraising. So we're going to have a, a dinner at uh, Lily Seafood. If you go there anytime on Wednesday and tell your waitress or barkeeper that you're supporting the Welcome In, a percentage of your ticket will go to support this ministry. And I'm on the board of the directors, so if after the service you'd like to learn more about the Welcome In, certainly ask me and I'll be more than happy to try to answer your questions. And finally, next week, there will be a special opportunity for us as a church family to come together to watch a movie. And Dr. Althea Simpson, our Director of Discipleship, has organized this. And she's going to say a few words about this. So when you hear the name Samson, most people think they know the story. And they immediately think about Delilah. And actually, Samson's story is so much more than his relationship with Delilah. In fact, that is a very small piece of the story. And how many of you know that Delilah isn't the one who actually cuts Samson's hair? Lots of people think she did, but she didn't. So there are so many things about this story that are exciting and interesting from the biblical text. So if you want to see what Hollywood does with it, Join us next Sunday, uh, February 25th. I have to get the date right because it's been printed wrong. At 1.30, we're going to the Southfield AMC Star to see the movie. It's $4, and hopefully many of you will come out and join us for this epic film. I don't know how the critics have liked it, but we'll see. We'll see how we, the critics, like it. So is it best to let you know, do we order tickets beforehand, or you just show up and uh, buy your tickets there? Just show up. Okay, so uh, next Sunday at uh, 1.30, we'll be going to Star Southfield to uh, watch Samson. Well, there's some other announcements in your bulletin, and again, we encourage you to read through your bulletin. But now I invite you to stand, and let's greet each other in Christian love. now gather ourselves. Let's remain standing for our call to worship. For everything there is a season. A time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born. And a time to die. A time to keep. And a time to give away. This is the season for repentance. For returning away from aimlessness and sin. For returning our lives to God. 
Please remain standing for our opening hymn, which is Come Christians Join to Sing, hymn number 158 in our hymnals. be seated and I invite the children if they could come up now and join me for our children's time <laughs> hey there Joey good morning gang how's everybody doing today okay Yes, good. So uh, it's been a good last week, right? A lot of cold snow. Well, I'm going to show you something in my bag, something that's uh, been happening this last week. So what do you see? The Olympics. The winter. How, how many have been watching the Winter Olympics? You've been watching the Olympics? What, sports, what sport do you like? Ice skating. Ice skating? What do you like? Snowboarding. Snowboarding. Skiing. 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 All right. So it's fascinating. When you watch the Olympics... We cheer on the U.S. athletes, right? Because they want to support their team. But when I watch it, probably like you, you're probably amazed at all the athletes, how skilled they are. They can make skiing and ice skating look so easy. But how do they get so good? A.J., how do they get so good at Practice. Lots of practice, right? And more practice. And they practice so much, they are at this level where they're world-class athletes. And when I watch those athletes... I'm inspired, and hopefully you're inspired, that whatever we want to do, that we make a commitment to that, just like those athletes do. And over this time, this is what we call Lent in the church, L-E-N-T. That's kind of a weird name, but it's a, a period of six weeks that we're now in leading up to Easter. And what Christians have done over the years have used this time of Lent to get closer to God, to use those disciplines like prayer and Bible study, maybe in fasting, going without food for a little time, to, again, draw our attention to God and become better Christians. So as I'm watching those athletes in the Olympics, I'm thinking, what can I do to be a better Christian? How can I discipline myself, right, to, again, do what God wants me to do? So hopefully you all will be inspired watching the, uh, the Olympics. We have one more week, right? More ice skating and more hockey and all those great sports. But at the end, the Olympics will finish and the athletes will go home, but we'll continue our journey, right? Doing the best we can to be children of God. So let's be inspired by these athletes and by others who practice and do discipline in order to be the best they can be, okay? So let's say a prayer and then we'll go fire up. So gracious God, 
we thank you for your love. Help us be better Christians. Amen. Well, thanks for coming up, gang, and uh, see you next week. Thank you, choir. That was very lovely. If you could, uh, please, please pray with me. Oh, Father, you are our creator and sustainer. You are our light and our fortress. You are our wisdom and our strength. Help all of us to live a life in a way that glorifies you, Lord. Give us the strength to be a blessing in someone's life today and grant us the opportunity to lead others into the freedom that can be found in knowing your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. As we progress through this winter season, we ask that you help us to shore up our faith and our Christian conviction. In so doing, this will enable us to help those who have yet to seek out you and plot their own spiritual enlightenment. As imperfect as each of us are, with your guidance, we can become ambassadors for Christ and act as modestly equipped disciples in his divine ministry. Most of us, most of all, Father, help us to peacefully coexist on, with each other on this earth. 
According to your word, we are all descendants of Abraham, and through the passing of peace, we may all share in this beautiful world together. We know, Father, such miracles are possible through diligent and earnest prayer if we can just humble ourselves to seek you out and lift these concerns up to you. We ask that you please be with those families who are devastated by the senseless acts of violence in Parkland, Florida last week. Help us to generate practical solutions for the mentally ill in this country. It's the most distressing and difficult social challenges such as these that we raise up to you. Be with us and guide us through this national conversation so we in fact can make a difference and make extreme acts of violence like these forever a thing of the past. Finally, Father, we ask that you place your hand of healing grace on those church members mentioned on our Franklin Community Church prayer list. Keep them within the borders of your righteous and healing pathway. Hear us now, Lord, as each of us reflects upon our innermost thoughts and concerns and peacefully raise them up to you. Oh, gracious and loving God, as we again continue in our prayers this morning, we journey now in this season of Lent and following the example of Jesus who spent 40, year, 40 days in the wilderness after his baptism. So we spend these 40 days in relationship with you and trying to strengthen our bonds that we have with you. So guide us and direct us, O oh Lord, in these days. And whether we decide to do something special or to give something up, may it be fruitful to our discipleship and again in our relationship with you. So we hold up each other in prayer. And we pray for a broken world. But we're inspired by the Olympics, not just the dedication of the athletes, but also the image of athletes from different countries all coming together to compete peacefully and even to have the South and North Korean athletes be on one team, again, gives us hope of what might be in the future. So we pray that you'll guide our leaders, those that make those important decisions, that they can look out for the best interests interest of all people and work for a lasting peace on this earth. So continue, again, to bless us and to strengthen us in whatever comes before us as we pray this all in Christ's name, and that same name we humbly pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we continue with our worship through the presentation of our offerings, and I ask our ushers to come and now receive our gifts.
Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 30. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So before I begin, I just want to say a few words. Uh, in 1986, I was ordained a deacon in the United Methodist Church. They don't do the same process now to get ordained as an elder, because what used to be is you'd go through a process, and you'd be ordained a deacon, and you'd be under probation for three years, and then you'd go before the board, and you'd be ordained an elder. Well, over the years, they've separated the two ordinations, and now there's separate deacons, and then they're elders. But when I was ordained deacon in 1986, this is what I wore to be ordained as a deacon. So this looks a little different. Looks sort of like a monk, right? Sort of looks like a monk. With some. So this is called an alb. And this is a liturgical outfit you would wear. It represents service, right? So this cincture here. And again, when I was ordained deacon, it's an office, a ministry of service. So I thought this would be the appropriate uh, pulpit gown, if you will, to wear. Later on, I bought a pulpit gown, a robe. It looks more like an ac academic robe. But this, you'll see some pastors wear these albs, but not many. But again, I'm wearing it now because this is a season of Lent. And Lent is a kind of a time of discipline, a time to humble ourselves for these 40 days. And when Easter comes, maybe we'll be in a, a better place, a closer place with our Savior. So if you were wondering why Dave is looking like a monk this morning, that's why I'm looking like a monk. So uh, just a little, little information for your liturgical knowledge. But I invite us to pause in a moment of prayer. And now, O Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? So, if Jesus came in that door and stood before you right now and said, who do you say that I am? How would you respond? What do you believe about Jesus and about your faith? Well, to help us think about that concept of Jesus and our faith, I'm using a resource by Adam Hamilton. It's called Creed. And again, if you read your newsletter, I talked a little bit about this and also at the announcements. So basically, it's a six-week study as we look at the Apostles' Creed. And there's a resource with a video that I'll be using on Tuesday night, so you're invited to come to that. But also, I'll be using this resource as part of my study. But before we look at the elements of the Apostles' Creed, I thought it'd be helpful for us today to look at the concept of a creed. What is a creed? And are they important? And since we're using the Apostles' Creed, it's the most known creed and it's the one in the series, we might be wondering, where, where did that creed come from? And even more importantly, are we supposed to believe everything that's stated in that creed? So let's get started. To help us get thinking about creeds, I'm going to have you watch in just a moment a video by this band called Petra. And this is an 80 band, thus the big hair. So uh, this is a Christian rock band, and they sang a song, Creed. And hopefully things will work out and Harrison will pull it up and we'll be able to hear just a portion of the song Creed. I believe in 
So, go back to the slide. So, what was the very first two words of that song? I believe. Because basically that's what a creed is. It's a statement of belief. I mean, we may associate creeds with the Christian faith, but a creed can be part of any faith, religion, denomination. It's just a belief in something that we hold dear. So again, a creed is a set of beliefs that are held by either a group of people or a creed can be something that an individual stands for. It's their position. It's an individual's position on their faith and understanding. Now, as I mentioned in my newsletter article, that there used to be a confirmation resource, and this is the process <clears throat> that our students go through to become members of the church. But years ago, there was a, a confirmation material. It was called Credo. And, ba <clears throat> excuse me, and basically, <clears throat> excuse me, it was during confirmation experience that the students looked at what they believed. So through the whole confirmation class, the students looked at all the different parts of the Christian faith, and the big component of confirmation was at the very end of that process, each student had to write out their own creed. They had to write out exactly what did they believe about God, about Jesus Christ, about the Holy Spirit, and about the church. So it was their way of clarifying exactly what they believed and these students, they were in the seventh and eighth grades, so certainly they had a long way of going to really finalize and solidify their belief system. But for them, it was a start. And when they were confirmed, they claimed the name of Christian, like all students. Even when we joined the church, we claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But do we really give much thought to what it means to say Jesus is our Lord and Savior? So through confirmation, our students looked at those elements and they claimed the name Christian, and they had a better idea of exactly what that means. Now, when I would use that curriculum, credo, with the confirmation class, since we were studying the creeds in my confirmation class, every Sunday during worship, we would include an historic or contemporary creed as part of our worship service. So I thought, since Will, since we are looking at the Apostles' Creed over the next five weeks, Every Sunday during church, we'll read together an affirmation or faith or an creed. Now, some of you might recall a time where when you would go to church every week, you would recite a creed. It was either the Apostles' Creed, or maybe if you were Episcopalian or if you were Catholic, it would have been the Nicene Creed. So when I was growing up, my pastor, this was in the 70s, he had us always say the modern affirmation of faith. In fact, if you look in the back of the hymnal, don't do it now, but if you look in the back of the hymnal, you'll find the modern affirmation. So we would say it week after week after week. And we said it so much, I memorized the thing, right? And even now, I couldn't start off, but if we start saying that modern affirmation of faith, guess what? I can recite the whole thing to you. So you might be wondering, David, if we used to say together these affirmation of faith, these creeds, why don't we do it today? Well, that's a good question. Well, I think there's several reasons we don't do the creeds week after week. One is they, they lose their impact. They become so familiar. So again, we, we say it so much that we take it for granted. In fact, we get to the point we just say these things by rote. In fact, we say it so much that we can almost sleep through we can say it while sleeping, right? We can say it while sleeping. But the other reason we don't say creeds every week, and this is even more important thing, is that United Methodists and other mainline Protestant churches, we are not creedal churches. And what does that mean? Well, if you're a creedal church, you have a set of beliefs that everyone believes. So in the United Methodist Church, that's just not the way we are. So if you have the Apostles' Creed read every Sunday, if you come to worship at that church, you start believing that if I'm going to be a member of this church, I'm going to have to adhere to everything that's in that creed. And that's clearly not the point. Because all United Methodists do not believe the same thing. So for example, in the Apostles' Creed, it says, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
That's part of that creed. Now, there are some faithful Christians that do not believe in the supernatural birth of Jesus. They don't believe that Mary was a virgin. They don't believe that the Holy Spirit came upon them. That's, that's their belief. So there's many people in the Christian faith who believe that. Now, is that part of the belief that Mary was a virgin? Was that the critical component to be saved? Well, probably not. So again, that's one reason why we don't say the creed every single week. Now, when we do use creeds, like when I will use a creed, especially the Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed in worship, before we even say the creed, there'll be an invitation, which will be, let us now recite this historic confession of the Christian faith. So again, we're clarifying this is historic. This is not a creed that we all have to adhere to. Now, since it's historic, let's spend a few minutes looking at the Apostles' Creed. So the history of the creed. So legend has it that how the creed was formed was that the original apostles came together and they each contributed one part of the Apostles' Creed. So the original disciples, that's the legend, that that's how we got the Apostles' Creed. Well, the reality is that the first reference of an Apostles' Creed or symbol, as it was called, was in a letter to the Pope in A.D. 390. But it didn't really seem to get foothold because it wasn't until the middle half of the 5th century that the Apostles' Creed became well known amongst the Christian world. But unlike the Nicene Creed that was formulated by a group of religious leaders who came together to debate what the church stood for and what they wanted to believe, the Apostles' Creed just sort of appeared kind of out of nowhere. But over time, different phrases were added to the Apostles' Creed. So for example, the original version of the Apostles' Creed didn't have this line, maker of heaven and earth. So that was later added to the creed. Now in our hymnal, you'll find two versions of the Apostles' Creed. There's the traditional version and the ecumenical version. And so for this Lenten study, we'll be lo looking at and using the ecumenical version. So I'm gonna invite you now to take your hymnal and turn to page 881. So everybody gets to pick up their hymnal and a little exercise here. So on 881, actually there's two. There's 81, then you see lower 82. You see both versions. There's the traditional version as well as the ecumenical version. Now the difference is that, well, actually there's similarities. If you look at both the traditional and ecumenical, you'll see that the first section is exactly the same. Word by word, the exact same statement. And if you continue on to the very last section, you'll see also that it also is the exact same words. So where's the difference come? Well, if you read that middle section, then you'll see that there are some differences. For example, in the ecumenical service, uh, version, the language he descended from the dead was inserted. And also you'll find that the language is a little more contemporary in the ecumenical version. So for example, in the traditional it says, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall, cudge, he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Now in the ecumenical, it says he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. So again, it's saying the same things, but the words a little bit more contemporary there in the ecumenical version. So since you have the creeds in front of you, i like us to read it together. But if you forgot your glasses, and that print is pretty small, we are, we'll have it up on the big screen, just in case your eyes are a little weak and it's hard to read those pages. So let's read together the ecumenical version of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. So that is the creed. And over the next five weeks, we'll be looking at the major portions of the creed. We'll be looking at next week, God. The following week, we'll be looking at Jesus Christ and what it means to claim Jesus Christ. Next is the Holy Spirit, then the church and communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and then on Easter Sunday, we'll gather together on April 1st, no fooling, and we'll be looking at the resurrection of the body. So, Lent is a time where Christians use these 40 days to reflect and have spiritual renewal. And I pray that all of us will use these times. There goes my notes. <laughs> I better get those. <laughs> Real excited here, right? So again, I pray that over these 40 days, we'll use this time to look at what do we believe? I mean, we might say, I'm a Christian. Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. I believe in the community. Well, have we really given much thought of what that means? So how can we do that? Well, we can come to my study on Tuesday nights, but if that doesn't work, come to worship on Sunday mornings because we'll be looking at each of these issues and trying to sort out what we believe. And again, what I'll say then, and I'll set it in my, my, my article, is these coming weeks I'll share what I come to know about this subject, about God, Jesus Christ. Adam Hamilton shares out of his experience, but no way are we expecting you, am I expecting you, to exactly believe as David Hustletine believes. Because again, that's just not the way we operate as an I this. I'll share out of my experience what I believe, and historically, what the understanding has been. But ultimately, it's up to us, individually, to claim our faith and to be able to articulate that faith as we move forward. Now, speaking of articulating our faith, when I was in seminary, I had to take a class called Systematic Theology. And it was sort of like confirmation class on steroids. Because basically what we did is we looked at different theologians and what they believed, and we, we read their theolo theologies, we talked about those in class, and then at the end of class, we had to write our own systematic theology. 20 plus pages of our own personal belief. And it was a struggle, we had to get a concept, and we wrote, and we wrote, and we re rewrote, and it was stressful, maybe not quite as stressful as this guy, but it was a stressful time, but in the end, it was worthwhile, right? Because all of us in systematic theology, almost all of us, we're going to be pastors. And if we're going to be pastoring a church, we really have to come to grips, right, with what we believe and how we came to that understanding. So like in confirmation, when we begin out, you know, the students think, oh, this is going to be boring. Oh, man, what am I doing? My parents want me to do confirmation, so here I am. But as they go through that class and they they think about their theology, and they actually would write out their creed, they realize that, hey, this is good stuff. I know now what I believe. So this is my creed. So friends, I challenge us over this time of Lent to think about our creed. I'm not going to ask you to write a paper. Don't worry about that. You're not being graded. But it will be a worthwhile experience as we walk through God and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, all those parts of the Apostles' Creed, and to come to some understanding of what you claim as your faith, so that by Easter Sunday, when we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, if Jesus came here to be with us, and he said, okay, we celebrate Easter, what is your creed? What do you believe? What will we say? Let us pray. Oh, gracious Lord, over the years, uh, your servants have put down on paper understandings of our faith. And so over the years, we've recited those creeds as a way to affirm those beliefs. But each of us has a responsibility to claim our own faith, our own understanding of what it means to be a follower of Christ. So maybe we'll use these 40 days to help make concrete those things that have been uh, in our minds circling around and maybe not 
put down in a, in a concrete way. So help us, O oh Lord, so at the end of this season, it will truly be a joyous time of Easter. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, speaking of 40 days, our last hymn is Lord Who Throughout These 40 Days on the screen or on page 269. Friends, may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in the love and knowledge of God Almighty and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. And the presence and power of God Almighty be with us today and always. Amen. <laughs>